This morning I want to share from God's Word with you. And if you have your Bibles, reading from the King James Version. St. John chapter 6. St. John chapter 6. I want to begin reading with verse 53. John chapter 6. <laughs> In many ways, the church, I'm talking about the church in general, not per se the Pentecostal church or the Baptist or the Methodist or Presbyterians or otherwise, but talking about the church in general, especially the evangelical church. I think until most recently, for the past 20 years or more, little by little has done things so that the church can make its people feel more comfortable. In other words, we don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to make anybody in the congregation feel uncomfortable with our terminology, our, our preaching, or with what we stand for. Amen. And over these this period of years, one of the things that has almost disappeared from the church's literature, from its songbooks, and from its preaching, is the blood. That's one thing that is not preached on nearly as much, including some Pentecostal service. But ladies and gentlemen, the blood is the very central the very central platform for all that the church of Jesus Christ is built on. Yes. When Jesus came to this earth, He came not to do away with the law, but He came to fulfill it. Yes. And thus, even though we live by many of the, of the great truths that were taught in the law, for instance, the Ten Commandments, how many still believe in the Ten Commandments? Amen. That's something that is that is uh, is an earmark of what's happening in our country today. Uh, we're not we're not allowed for the Ten Commandments to be shown publicly in most places of business, our courts, or any other place. And because of that, we don't have that word basic foundation to build our church doctrine upon. And because of that, as the question was given to me this past week, and I really find it hard to explain it, I trust I did, I did rightly, someone said, why is there so many denominations? Why do you have, just in the Baptist church, there's over 102 different Baptist organizations. Just under the Baptist name. Under the Pentecostal name, there's probably 50 different denominations. Why do we have this? Somewhere along the line, somebody come up with a fresh new idea. And they got some people to follow them. I'm not saying that all of them or any of them are particularly wrong. Many, I believe, are not preaching the full gospel. How many can say amen? amen? There are denominations under the evangelical church that are not preaching the full gospel. But by the same token, someone come up with an idea and people follow it. But ladies and gentlemen, 
I want the I want the Mount Morris Gospel Tabernacle not just to be named the Assemblies of God. Because there's probably a, as many different type of services under the Assemblies of God as you'll find in any denomination. You can come north and see one type of worship. You can go south and see a completely different kind of worship. You can go west and see another type. So, basically, I'm not talking about modes of worship. I'm talking about church doctrine. I'm talking about the Word. And I believe today that our church in Mount Morris needs to be settled and built upon the solid foundation of the whole truth of the Word. Yes, amen. Not leave anything out. Amen. And that includes the blood of Jesus. Yes, amen. God has really dealt with me. I was walking the other day and Sister Shoemaker came back to my mind. She was my English teacher in Bible school. She used to cry over me as I told you. At the end of every English class, she was in positive tears over me. And it wasn't tears of joy. She says, why did you have to come from down in, in the country where they still say ain't? She was very, or she, she didn't like that word at all. And uh, various things. But one thing she told me, and I've shared with you, some of you, she says, never stop preaching the blood. Amen. Never stop preaching the blood. I want you to listen to Jesus' own words in this chapter. Chapter 6 of John, beginning with verse 20, uh, 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink His blood, Ye have no life in you. Now, if I wasn't church, and somebody got up and preached that to me, I would be a little bit confused too. The people Jesus was talking to already had a different mindset than He did. They had come together around Him and hear Him talk. They had given questions to Him to try to trip Him up doctrinally. <clears throat> Jesus turns to them. And He says, unless, in essence, what He said was, unless you're willing to eat of My body. Here was a living, breathing man standing before them. Unless you're willing to eat of My body and drink of My blood, you'll not have eternal life. You cannot live forever. Then he goes on to say in verse 54, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And I feel impelled to go maybe just a little further, even for your benefit. He that eateth my flesh, verse 56, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread. And I think here, Jesus began to explain what he was talking about. There are many denominations today, ladies and gentlemen, and I need to clarify this. Because of this scripture, there are many denominations that believe that when you take of the cup and you take of the bread, it becomes literal. And you literally are eating the flesh of God and the blood you're drinking. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that the cup we partook of this morning and the bread is symbolic. Yes. Yeah. It is not the actual flesh. It is not the actual blood. But it is symbolic of eating His flesh and drinking His blood. Do you understand? Yes. Amen. And Jesus said, unless you're willing to be partaker with me, you cannot have eternal life. 
I'm glad, ladies and gentlemen, this morning as a born again believer, that I am in Jesus. Amen. How many can raise your hand and say, I'm in Jesus? Amen. Let's give him a hand this morning. Somebody Jesus, I, until He comes back, I will continue to take of His flesh and drink of His blood. Every time I partake of His Word, I partake of His flesh. Every time I feel the life-giving flow of the Holy Ghost come into me and make me a stronger believer, I am eating of the bread of life. How many believe that? And that's what He said at the end of this text that I am reading. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna. You hear that? Yes. Not as your fathers, that's the Israelites in the wilderness, when God fed them manna. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Amen. Wow. Praise the Lord. And I cannot eat. Now here's the truth of this. <clears throat> Taking communion is a serious matter. <clears throat> I remember my mother. And she'd sat on the edge of the pew. She always brought me and my twin brother to the front. Back in then, you know, we had a little church, maybe 20 people. Everybody could be at the altar. I remember when I first came here, we could be at the altar. But it's impossible for us to do that now. And so we must uh, partake of communion in the fashion that we do. Everyone understands that, don't you? Although I want you to know the altar is open to anyone who wants to come. Anytime. This altar is always open to you for your need. My mother would sit at the end of the pew. Me and my twin brother would kneel. She'd make us kneel. She had bad knees. So she'd sit, we'd kneel. Well, you know, our pastor, we had just... He, he sort of got into preaching and everything he did. Hey, yes. <laughs> and so sometimes the communion services would be so long because he'd stand up there and talk and talk and talk before they ever got started to take the communion. And this wasn't his sermon either. Here we were kneeling, me and my twin brother, just little toe heads. I know a couple <laughs> others running around. <laughs> My toe head is a blonde, didn't he? Yeah. Or her? Yeah. We were kneeling down. I had real bright blonde hair. When I was young, lost the blonde hair, lost the hair. <laughs> we were kneeling, and all of a sudden, you know how we are, we little boys, you know, we were kneeling there, and Tom was real strict, and we were, we were kneeling down, all of a sudden, I'd get over and I'd flip him on the ears. <laughs> you know, well, that would turn, he'd flip me. <laughs> And I'd feel a slap on the back of my crown. <laughs> and she'd look down and say, boys, this is sacred. I don't want to hear one more thing out of you. You stay right where you're at. What you're doing is sacred. Be sure you do it for the Lord and love Him. I can remember that just as clear as day. And oftentimes when I was a young kid, even into the ministry, I wondered why, why mom was so vehement about the communion service. Everybody had to be, you know, just so-so and, and, and today. Wasn't it wonderful taking communion today? It's a time to praise the Lord. Yeah. It's a time to give Him praise and honor. And you know, it's also a time to be sacred because you see, I can't take communion. I can't eat of the body of my Lord and Savior. I cannot drink of His blood unless I am a born-again Christian. I cannot do it. That's why Paul talked. He said, if you partake of this cup and this bread unworthily, you're drinking and eating damnation to your soul. So it's important that if we partake of the communion service, we do it because we know we're born again. We're saved. And then we can partake of the body and of the blood every day. And the more we feed on Him, and drink of His precious blood symbolically. I become healthier as a Christian. And whatever ailments come into this old carcass of mine, this body of mine, automatically, maybe there's not a preacher around, or a board member, or someone else to anoint me with oil and pray the prayer of faith. But as long as I'm feeding on that flesh and drinking from that blood, I can say, Jesus, touch me with your healing stripes. 
and he will because I'm, 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 this is literal. I am literally feeding on the spiritual body of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I am literally drinking of the spiritual blood of my Savior Jesus Christ. And as long as I drink of that blood, when I say blood, you know, I'm speaking about forgiveness of sins. I'm talking about a clear conscience. Amen. Every Christian ought to have a clear conscience. Yes. How do I get a clear conscience? I get it because I partake of the blood. Amen. And as that blood washes me, it cleanses away all those bad thoughts that old girl devil puts in. Maybe I'm probably the only one in church today that ever gets bad thoughts. <laughs> Satan will bring stuff to me that I'm positively ashamed of. Oh, thank God. <laughs> that I'm positively ashamed of. And I wouldn't repeat some of the stuff that flows through my mind. I couldn't repeat. I'm sorry. If you need to fire me, then do it. But I'll, I'll tell you. But the thing is, when I start drinking of the blood, and I start pleading the blood on this mind and on these thoughts, for some reason, somehow, God purges those thoughts. And He takes that horrible stuff out of my mind. I don't let it stay there. You see, it's not. Paul taught that. He taught. He said, it's not what runs through your mind. It's what you allow to stay there. And you build it. That's what becomes corruption. Can we say amen? Yeah. I haven't started my sermon yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give you a long though. I know you believe it. Believe it. <laughs> Let's talk about the blood very quickly this morning. Five things about the blood. Number one. First of all, just before I start with number one, put on your theme this morning, the miracle power of the blood. If you're writing notes, the miracle power of the blood. Number one, the blood heals. How many believe that? The blood heals. Yeah. You know it's very scriptural. Somebody, uh, it wasn't too awful long ago. I was praying in another service. And so, well, someone had asked me to lead in prayer. And as I was leading in prayer, it wasn't in this church, uh, I prayed, oh God, allow your blood to cleanse and heal. And then some gentleman walked up to me and said, that's not doctrinal. That's not doctrinal. And I looked to him and I said, sir, how long has it been since you read Isaiah 53? Well, that's only about the stripes. I said, you've got to go down further than the stripes. And you'll find that he took away my iniquity with his blood. Yes. Not only does he take away my iniquity, he heals me, body and spirit. Amen. I can claim the work of the blood because the blood not only redeems the spirit, but it redeems the body. Amen. How many know what I'm talking about? Am I speaking the truth this morning? Well, then, if I am, I want you to know that Isaiah chapter 53 says it in just a couple, three verses. Verse 5 through 7. Don't turn. I'm going to read it. Write it down. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we are healed. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to His own way. The, and, and, he, and we have laid on Him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and He was afflicted. Yet he opened, not his mouth. He is brought, here it is, the blood. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Now, I don't want to get crude this morning. When you slaughter an animal, I know this sounds crude, but we have to say it. It's not a clean job. Why is that? Why is it when you slaughter a live animal, it's not a clean job? Because you've got to somehow, the blood's got to get out of there. So when the Bible speaks about, they, he came as a lamb to the slaughter. 
They didn't cut him up in pieces and freeze him. They shed his blood. That's right. And because of his shed blood, not only is my iniquity taken away, but my body is healed. Yes. Amen. You know what made those stripes liable on his back? I know one of the reasons for the stripes is the affliction of pain. I believe he took the pain so I don't have to have it. Yeah. You see, to a certain extent when it comes to sin. But I believe, this is my personal opinion, Tomlinson Dog. I believe what made those stripes on his back viable was the drops of blood. <coughs> I believe it. I believe it. Because of that blood coming through those stripes, by his stripes, we are healed. Blood. How many believe? The blood heals? Yeah. And the blood saves? Yeah. Through the Holy Ghost and through the name of Jesus. If you're here today and you've got an ailment in your body, plead the blood. Ask the Lord to let His healing virtue flow through you. How many remember that little lady who was crawling around through people's legs in the Bible? And she had been one, went to every doctor and couldn't find anybody to heal her. She had an issue of blood. She was bleeding internally. And she just kept going and going and going, spent all of her life's earnings. And she had no place else to go. And the Bible says that Jesus came into town. Everybody gathered around him by the hundreds, maybe even as much as a thousand or more, gathered about him. And everybody was coming in close to him. In fact, it came so close that the apostles were saying, get away, get away, you're too close. This little lady, she had tried everything. She had heard that Jesus came. She had heard that in the last town, he touched somebody's blind eyes. That's right. He took somebody that had been lame all their life and took them by the hand. And they walked. News travels quick. And she saw him. Somebody said, there he is. Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus of Nazareth? Where's Jesus of Nazareth? He said, over there. See that guy in the middle of that crowd? The Bible says she got down and she crawled. I shouldn't do this. <laughs> you can't see me. Only you've chosen you. <laughs> she crawled in between the legs of the men and women until she got close enough that she could reach and extend out her arm. The Bible says when she touched the hem of his garment. She was made whole. Well, there's a lot of truth in that. But I'll tell you the bigger truth. The bigger truth is that Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, Who touched me? Yes. Who touched me? For I felt virtue leave my body. He cut up a sun You talk about eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. That little woman learned what it was to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, and he wasn't even on the cross yet. And his healing virtue came out of his body into her. That same spiritual strength of healing is what happened when Jesus died on the cross. Now I can say to him, Jesus, I need your help. Can I feed on your flesh a little bit today? And he says, go open up to Isaiah 53 or, or to John chapter 6 or to Ephesians chapter 4 or to Philippians chapter 3 and 4. And he says, feed my flesh. You see, his word is his flesh. How many believe that? Yeah. The word is the bread of life. The bread of life. Yeah. And brother, that's why it's different from any, any other book. I just talked and counseled with an individual this week. And they said, they said, I don't understand. Pastor Thompson, since I became a Christian, I used to read the Bible and I didn't feel nothing. But now when I open that Bible, I get chills all over me. <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what that is. It's because now you're a child of God. And when you open up that Bible and begin to read, you start eating his flesh. Come on, come on. Who told you? I believe that. How many believe that? You start eating of his flesh. And when he forgives you and sanctifies you, yes. you drink of his blood. 
I never want to stop. The miracle working power of the blood. Number two. I have another scripture. I don't have time to read it. I want you to put it down in your notes. Powerful scripture. Romans chapter 5. Now I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Verses 1 through 11. I'm just going to read verse 9. But I want you to read that. 1 through 11 when you get opportunity. Romans chapter 5. I'll read verse 1, verse 9. I'm really compromising here. But I'm not, I don't want to take any more time than possible. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How many can say amen? amen. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. How many can say amen? amen. Glory. Well, I could just speak in tongues all day, but that doesn't mean you're no good. Hallelujah. I need to talk so you can understand me, and I still hope you can understand me. Somebody the other day was talking to me, said, Pastor said, Well, I've been hearing some good ministers, but they, they talk words I don't understand. I said, You'll never have to worry about that with me. I don't have that education. But I hope you understand what I'm saying today. Number two, the miracle working power of the blood. First of all, the blood heals. Secondly, the blood keeps. The blood keeps. And verse 54 of our text. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. I believe this. And I agree with my Baptist friends on this to a point. I believe if I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and I become a born again Christian, I believe that I can stay a Christian for eternity. As long as I choose to. But if I choose to divert away from that, that I can condemn myself. Yes, amen. How many believe that? Amen. If you don't believe that, read the Bible. Because that's what the Bible teaches. But you see, I am safe, secure. That's a terminology that our Baptist friends and others use. I love it. I am secure in Jesus. I believe in eternal security. Yes. As long as I'm secure. Amen. As long as His blood's still flowing over me. Yes. As long as I'm still eating of His flesh. Right. Then I am eternally secure. In Jesus. That's why Jesus taught that day in my text. You eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you'll live forever. Amen. Am I correct? Amen. That's exactly why He taught that. That's exactly why He taught that. Number three. I'm hustling. Number three. Not only does the blood heal, not only does the blood keep, but the blood satisfies. <laughs> Never heard that, Pastor. You're hearing it for the first time. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Write it down. Having made peace, there is the key. Having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say, whether they be things on earth, or things in heaven. You may have walked in this church this morning and you may have been as troubled as anybody can be. And I know we got lots of trouble. We got a lot of lots of families in our church that are hurting right now because of excruciating situations. But I want you to know something, folks. In the midst of all those situations, my Jesus still satisfies. Amen. Is oh no, that's wrong. <laughs> Is he satisfied? I was thinking something. Are you satisfied? You see, that word peace, that word peace can fall under the category of being satisfied. When I go home in the evening, Rose, hold your seat. When I go home in the evening, I've been out for 14, 15 hours doing church work, and I come home, I want to go to my chair, and I want to sit down. I always... Talk to the wife a little. Just generally. But I don't want to sit there and I lay my head back and hear somebody say, you got to do this. You got to do that. Why isn't this done? No other man's ever been through that. <laughs> and no other lady, including Rose, has ever done it. 
I don't know where I got that thought. <laughs> there are times to talk about those things, but when you go home to your haven, you want to be at peace. And, and I, I didn't mean that in a hard way. Good. Good. Be a good heart. How many understand my drift? I'm having trouble. Praise the Lord. I believe there's a satisfied place in Jesus. When that blood begins to flow, it brings a peace. My text that The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ through His blood. Number four, not only does the blood heal and keep and satisfy, but the blood protects. This one I do want to read. Turn back with me to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. The blood protects. I believe in cleaning the blood when I take a trip in the car. I plead the blood every day on my church people, on my family, my wife, my home. This scripture tells us, chapter 12, beginning with verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. For I am the Lord. And the scripture tells us that God's judgment upon, upon these people were not on the Israelites. It was directed toward the Egyptians because of their refusal to obey the voice of God. Now, here was the question. How many knows? And this is what I want you to remember. I think that if we fail to take advantage of the benefits that the blood and the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ afford us. If we fail to do that, we expose ourselves to outside elements. This is what the scripture says. The Bible in this scripture says, I'm telling you, Israel, put the blood on your door. This judgment that I am outpouring is not intended for you. But I believe he said these words, if it was in contemporary fashion, it would be like this. But I'm warning you, if the blood isn't on your doorpost, then you could lose your firstborn too. That's right. How many believe that? That's right. I believe that's what the scripture taught. You say, Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying if we have the opportunity to plead the blood and to protect our kids and to protect our household and to protect our church. Yes. Why shouldn't we do it? Yes. Because if we fail to do it, then God's judgment upon this world system could infringe itself through this world system upon us. That's why lots of people are going through such bad calamity when it comes to not knowing the Lord or not being close to Jesus is because, is because if we're not covered with the blood, we put our home, we put our church in jeopardy. I'm a firm believer in that. You're going to go home and say, well, the pastor scared me today. I would that God, more Christian people would be scared. And realize in this day and age in which we live, I don't care what you do, plead the blood. Yeah. Plead the blood on your mind, on your body, on your family, on your household, on your church, on every member, on every attending person. Plead the blood. Because that's where the protection is. In the blood. When we get into the new part, we're going to anoint every pew. We're going to anoint every doorpost. They say they're even going to anoint me. 
which is fine. Because if it worked for Aaron, I believe it worked for me. Yes, amen. I want his protection and I want his anointing. Right. How many wants the anointing? Amen. I close with this. I, I, I'm not quite done with that. And I'm going to close with that. But could you follow me on the verses? Thank you. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Verse 12. Both men and beasts and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you, it is a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. They were asked, all Israel, to look and to respect this every year as a Passover feast. How many know that? That's what Amen. Israel is asked to do. This day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout all your generations, and you shall keep it a feast by ordinance forever. And I stop with this verse. I thought it most interesting. Verse 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. Now, I don't know whether you know what that means, but the Bible seems to portray in the Old Testament that the process by which leaven does. When I speak of leaven, I speak of yeast. Or the process by which yeast works. And you know if you if you put if you take and bake bread without yeast or leaven, then the bread will be flat. It'll be good. It tastes alright. But it, it'll be flat and sort of tough to chew maybe or something. But it's pure. Now, the leaven by which you put in the bread is, is a contaminated process. I hate to tell you that. You're actually putting something into the bread that's spoiled. And through the fermenting process, it makes the bread rise and it will explode if you don't take it off the heat. I remember my mother-in-law forgot it. She made bread all the time. I'll never forget it. I was down deer hunting and she wanted to make bread for me. She was getting up in years and unable to do it very much. But I was her favorite out of all those kids. <laughs> Seemed like every time I went home, she was always doing it for me. So I took it to Ivan's bed. But at any rate, she was making bread. She put it on the stove. She had, they, they still had the, I think this one, they still had that wood stove or something there. And she had put it on the stove and she'd leave it. Well, she forgot. And I'd come in, I was late. I'd come in late. I was dirty. And I, I slept, uh, for a while, I slept on the floor in the living room because I wasn't in very good condition. And then I put an old thing on the couch so I wouldn't dirty it and laid on the couch and all of a sudden I heard, BANG! <laughs> pop, pop! And I went out there and one of them loaves of bread had, had exploded. I don't know what she had in it. <laughs> that baby exploded. <laughs> Maybe that's what I shot at. <laughs> but anyway, that, that fermentation causes, causes a different reaction. It's not that the blowing up of the bread, if that's what you call it, rising of the bread is wrong because it makes it taste good. To me it does. But it's the process that is contaminated. And the Bible says, and told Israel, this is an example to you of what your life should be. When you partake of bread during this Passover feast, if anybody in Israel puts leaven in their bread, I will mark them out of the Israeli nation. 
so it no longer be a part three. It's right there. Why? Because the Bible seems to speak that that process was a sinful <coughs> process. And says, when you come to Jesus, let the blood cleanse you. Take out the leaven. How many has ever heard of you? Remember Jesus when he talked about the leaven and the Pharisees? That sin, self-righteous attitude. He said if you people would, would come down off a of cloud nine of your egotism and begin to realize that God is standing right in front of you, you can have the same thing that Israel had. You can have the same thing the Gentiles will have. Because you can't come down off of your high horse, you're going to lose it all. Today I close with this. Ladies and gentlemen, without the blood, without the blood, it is useless for me as a Christian. Listen to me because I mean every word. Without the blood of Jesus, it is useless for me to continue as a Christian. Without the blood of Jesus. I lift off my life the protection of God. I lift off my life the healing virtue of Jesus. And I lift off my life the continued work of grace that works through me day by day by day. I know what I'm talking about. I cannot afford to go a day without the blood as a Christian. Would you bow your heads? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter. This is number five. We're in a prayerful attitude. You may want to put this in your notes there. The blood offers opportunity. The blood offers opportunity. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Listen to me, family. Family of God. Questions have been asked me this more than anything else. Why did Jesus have to come in the form of flesh? The Bible says that He taking on, God taking on the form of flesh was the same as the veil which covered the holiest place. And so God could not come down and walk among men without a veil. So the body, the fleshly body became a veil to cover God's holiness. Now the Bible says there's only one way that we can have all that we want from Jesus. And that is to believe that when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was ripped away by stripes, by shedding of blood, by beatings, and by death. That fleshly veil was taken away. And if you remember, folks, on the third day, when Jesus arose from the dead, He arose with a glorified body. He was, and He says, when we go to heaven, we'll have a body like His. He did away with that flesh, that veil, that covered His holiness when He went to the cross. And at the same time, the Bible says the veil in the temple was split and ripped from top to bottom and opened wide open into the holiest place. Now, Hebrews 10, 19 says, we don't have to hold back anymore. We can go straight into His presence with no barriers. Aren't you glad for that this morning? Maybe somebody by the upraised hand would say, Pastor, I need the blood on a situation in my family, in my home. By the upraised hand, I need His blood today. I need to plead it. Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need the blood on my body. I need the blood on my sickness. I need the blood on sin in my home. I plead it today. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. 
Maybe somebody in this church this morning would say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus as my personal Savior. And I need His blood to wash away my sins. The Bible says if you believe on Him as Lord and Savior, that blood typically automatically washes away. Fountain filled with blood. If you're here today, or anyone, you need to walk to this altar and say, Jesus, there are certain things that I need to lay at this altar. I need the blood to cover. If you feel you need to do that, this altar is open for you right now as we have this closing prayer. Is there anyone? I need the Lord as my Savior. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. God's speaking to you. If He's speaking to you, you need to come. Lay it on the altar. Get covered with the blood. Get covered with the blood. Is there anyone else? before we pray. Because of me being about the altar, there are Sundays that I'm unable to stand at the door and greet folks as they go out. I'm going to ask our ushers that they would make our folks extremely welcome when they leave the church this morning. I need some ushers to stand at the door and make sure that folks feel like we appreciate them as they leave. Will you take care of that for me? I appreciate it. I feel I need to be at this altar this morning. Is there anyone else before I pray? Okay, take someone's hand next to you as we pray for these people. And many hands in the audience that folks didn't feel that to come up, but they're here. And they said, I need the blood. Would you pray?